Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Today, CPSC staff will brief the commission on a draft notice of proposed rulemaking to establish a safety standard for clothing storage units. This proposed rule is intended to, uh, to address the risk associated with clothing storage units uh, tip overs, particularly involving those, uh, those involving children. Before we start today's briefing, however, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our newest commissioner, Rich Trumka. On behalf of the commission and CPSC staff, congratulations on your appointment, and we all look forward to working with you. And I hope that, uh, yeah, and personally, except for that, I hope that we have our final colleague confirmed soon and we have a fully constituted commission. So welcome, Rich. Today is the last of a series of four briefings on important rulemaking packages. Uh, I truly appreciate the hard work of the staff over these past few weeks. Um, that they've put into preparing these packages briefings. Um, the draft notice of proposed rulemaking we're being briefed on today is intended to address the risk of injury associated with clothing storage due to tip overs. Between January 2000 and December 2020, CPSC staff identified 226 fatalities associated with clothing storage units tipping over. 85% of these deaths involve children, 10% involve seniors and many more children and seniors are injured during this period. The proposed rule would require clothing storage units to be tested for stability, see minimum stability standard requirements, be marked and labeled for safety information, and bear a hang tag providing data about the stability of the unit. After staff briefs us on the specific of this proposed rule, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of the staff with multiple rounds if necessary. The following staff will brief the commission. Dr. Uh, Kirsten Talcott, uh, Project Manager, Division of Human Factors, uh, Director for Engineering Sciences. Uh, Meredith Kelsch, uh, Attorney in the Regulatory Affairs Division at the Office of General Counsel. Also in attendance are Mary Boyle, our Executive Director, Pam Stone, uh, who's Acting General Counsel, and Roberta Mills, our Secretary. One final point before I turn the meeting over to staff. Any questions that address the agents the agency's legal authority should be withheld until the closed executive session, which will the commission will hold directly following this public briefing. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Talcott and Ms. Kelsch for their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you mentioned, Meredith Kelsch and I will present the draft notice of proposed rulemaking for clothing storage units. We'll start the presentation with Meredith providing the overview of the legal elements. As the chairman mentioned, I am Meredith Kelsch. I'm an attorney with the Office of the General Counsel in the Regulatory Affairs Division. And I will be giving a brief overview of the statutory framework for issuing a standard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. This rulemaking falls under Section 7 and 9 and Section 27E of the CPSA. Sections 7 and 9 apply to performance requirements regarding stability and the labeling requirements, and Section 27E applies to the hang tag requirements. Next slide, please. Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA set out requirements for the Commission to issue a consumer product safety standard. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements or requirements regarding warnings or instructions. Any requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 7 of the CPSA also specifies that consumer product safety standards must be issued in accordance with the requirements in Section 9 of the statute. Next slide, please. Section 9 of the CPSA provides procedural and substantive requirements for issuing a consumer product safety standard. The Commission may begin a rulemaking with a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPR, or with an Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or ANPR. For clothing storage units, the Commission initiated rulemaking with an ANPR in November 2017. The briefing package and draft NPR summarize and respond to the comments that CPSA received in response to the ANPR. Next slide, please. Under Section 9, an NPR must include the text of the proposed rule, alternatives to the proposed rule, and a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 also requires that the Commission make certain findings before issuing a final rule. 
In addition, the Commission must provide two opportunities for comments. First, Section 9 requires that rulemaking be in accordance with Section 553 of the Administrative Procedure Act, which requires agencies to give notice of a proposed rule and the opportunity to submit written comments on it. Second, Section 9 requires the Commission to provide an opportunity for interested parties to make oral presentations of data, views, or arguments. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, one requirement under, for an NPR under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA is a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 of the CPSA provides specific elements that must be included in the preliminary regulatory analysis. It must discuss potential benefits and costs of the rule and who is likely to receive and bear them, reasons the standard submitted to the Commission was not published as part of the proposed rule, and alternatives to the proposed rule, their potential costs and benefits, and reasons they were not chosen. In addition to supporting the preliminary regulatory analysis, information about costs and benefits associated with the rule also help form the basis for several of the required findings for a final rule. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, to issue a final rule, the Commission must consider and make specific findings, and those findings must be included in the rule. Although the Commission does not have to make these findings at the NPR stage, preliminary findings are included in an NPR because Section 9 requires that the findings be included in the regulatory text, which must be provided in an NPR, and because this provides an opportunity for interested parties to comment on the findings. This slide shows eight of the nine required findings. And next slide, please. The final finding deals with voluntary standards. If a voluntary standard that addresses the risk of injury at issue has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find that either compliance with the voluntary standard is not likely to adequately reduce the risk of injury or that there is not likely to be substantial compliance with it. Next slide, please. The hang tag requirement in the draft proposed rule falls under Section 27E of the CPSA. Under Section 27E, the Commission may issue a rule to require manufacturers of consumer products to provide performance and technical data related to performance and safety to purchasers when necessary to carry out the purposes of the CPSA. Section 2 of the CPSA states the purposes of the statute, which include protecting the public against unreasonable risks of injury associated with consumer products and assisting consumers in evaluating the comparative safety of consumer products. I'll now turn it over to Kristen, who will provide further information about the briefing package and draft proposed rule. Thank you, Meredith. Now I will present findings in the staff briefing package. In this presentation, I will discuss the risk, particularly to young children, associated with clothing storage units, abbreviated as CSUs. I'll describe the data in the staff analysis of the factors leading to tip over which includes the child's interaction with the CSU, for example, climbing and pulling, multiple open and filled drawers, and placement of the CSU on carpet. I will also discuss the existing voluntary standards and staff assessments that they are inadequate to address the tip over hazards. Then I will describe the elements of the proposed rule which simulates the forces of children climbing or pulling on a CSU in a real world configuration that includes multiple open and filled drawers and an angle simulating carpet. I will also discuss the proposed labeling and hang tag requirements. Then I will provide an overview for the preliminary regulatory analysis and the initial regulatory flexibility analysis findings. Next slide, please. In the proposed rule, staff defines the CSU as a freestanding furniture item with drawers and or doors that may be reasonably expected to be used for storing clothing that is greater than or equal to 27 inches in height, and that has a total functional volume of the closed storage greater than 1.3 cubic feet, and greater than the sum of the total functional volume of the open storage and the total volume of the open space. This scope is determined based on staff analysis of incident involved units, units that are marketed as CSUs, and similar products on the market, as well as a contractor study on CSU use. Common names, for CSUs include chests, bureaus, dressers, armoires, wardrobes, chests of drawers, drawer chests, shipper robes, and door chests. 
Some CSUs are marketed, packaged, or displayed as intended for children 12 years old and younger. However, most CSUs are more commonly general use products. Next slide, please. Here are some pictures of products that fall within the scope of the draft MPR. As you can see, the scope encompasses a variety of products with closed storage space, including those with drawers only in a single column or multiple columns, products with a combination of drawers and doors, like the product shown on the right, and those with doors only. Next slide, please. In the draft NPR, staff recommends excluding two categories of products that would otherwise meet the definition of a CSU. The first is closed lockers, an example of which is shown on the left, which are defined as predominantly metal furniture items without exterior doors and with one or more doors that either lock or accommodate an external lock. The second is portable storage closets, which are defined as freestanding furniture items with an open frame that encloses hanging clothing storage space and or shelves. These items may have a cloth case with curtains, flaps, or doors that obscure the contents from view, as in the example shown on the right. Staff recommend excluding these products from scope because there are no known tip-over incidents associated with children in these products. Next slide, please. Staff found substantial variation in retail prices of CSUs, with the least expensive units retailing for less than $100, and some more expensive units that may retail for several thousand dollars. Staff estimated that shipments of dressers and chests totaled 43 million units in 2018, well over half the value of apparent consumption of non-upholstered wood furniture in 2019 was comprised of imported furniture, and this is likely true of CSUs as well. The estimated retail value of U.S. bedroom furniture sales in 2019 totaled over $60 billion, of which approximately $21 billion was the sales of closets, nightstands, and dressers. In 2017, there were just over 2,000 manufacturers of non-upholstered wood furniture, over 5,000 firms involved in household furniture importation and distribution, and almost 14,000 furniture retailers. Next slide, please. In the draft NPR, staff analyzed CSU typical fatality data from the years 2000 to 2020. In this time period, staff is aware of 226 total fatalities caused by CSU tip over or instability, including 193 child fatalities, 11 adult fatalities, and 22 senior fatalities. The graph at the bottom of this slide shows rough breakdown of fatal incidents by age and television involvement. The fatalities include 105 incidents in which both the CSU and television fell, and 121 incidents in which only a CSU fell. As you can see in the graph, regardless of television involvement, most reported CSU took over fatalities involved children three years old or younger. For fatal incidents involving a CSU without a television, 94% involved children three years old or younger. Next slide, please. Staff also analyzed reported non-fatal CSU tip-over incidents from the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System, abbreviated CPS-RMS, for the years 2005 to 2020. In this time period, staff is aware of 1,002 CSU tip-over or instability incidents for all ages, including 652 related injuries. Staff also analyzed data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, abbreviated NICE, from 2006 to 2019. These data come from a nationally representative probability sample of about 100 hospitals. During the analyzed time period, there was an estimated average of 5,600 emergency, emergency department treated CSU tip over injuries per year, including 4,000 child injuries. I want to note that for the years 2010 to 2019, the data show a statistically significant decrease in the overall number of estimated child injuries involving all CSUs, and that's including incidents with television. This appears to be driven by a decline in injuries from CSU tip-overs involving television, because over the same time period, the rate of emergency department-treated injuries to children from incidents involving CSUs only has remained stable. Because of this apparent decrease in CSU incidents with television, Staff focused on the subset incidents involving CSUs without television. Staff also focused on incidents involving children, 
because such a large percent of the fatal and non-fatal incidents involve children. Next slide, please. From January 2000 to March 2021, CPSC conducted 40 recalls of CSUs for tip over and entrapment hazards. These units were associated with 12 fatalities. The recalls involved 34 different firms and over 21 million CSUs. Next slide, please. The injuries caused by CSU tip over include soft tissue injuries such as cuts and bruises, skeletal injuries, bone fracture, skull fracture, closed head injuries, compressional and mechanical asphyxia, and internal organ crushing leading to hemorrhage. Most serious injuries and deaths are the result of blunt force trauma to the head and intense pressure on the chest that impairs the respiratory and circulatory system. Torso injuries are the most common form of injuries for tip over fatalities involving CSUs without television. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, staff focused on incidents involving children with CSUs without television in their analysis of the tip over hazards. For incidents that are reported to our fill level, most involve partially filled or fully filled drawers. 96% of fatal incidents and 90% of non-fatal incidents in included those drawer fill levels. For incidents with a reported flooring type under the CSU, a majority were on carpet, including over 82% of fatal incidents and 80% of non-fatal incidents. For instance, with a reported interaction type, timing was the most common reported interaction in the fatal incident, making up 74% of those incidents. Timing was also the most common reported interaction for emergency department treated incidents, making up 77% of those incidents. Timing was the second most common child interaction in the reported non-fatal incidents. The majority of child timing incidents, including 94% of fatal incidents, involve children three years old or younger. Opening multiple drawers was the most common interaction in the non-fatal CPS RMS incidents. The data show that children are capable of opening all drawers. Staff identified full force application heights in incidents ranging from less than a foot to almost four feet. Staff is also aware of incidents involving combinations of these factors, including a non-fatal tip over incident involving a three-year-old child climbing on a CSU with all seven drawers open and filled and the CSU on carpet. Next slide, please. This slide shows some examples of children's interactions with CSUs. These are still images from online videos. The videos show a variety of climbing techniques, including stepping on the top of the drawer face, stepping on the drawer knob, gripping the top of an upper drawer with the hand, and pushing up using the top of the drawer. They also show children pulling on drawers and children inside drawers at the CSU. I'd also like to point out that in three of the videos shown here, the one on the top left, the top middle, and the bottom right, the child is interacting with the CSU with all of the drawers open. Next slide, please. The primary voluntary standard that addresses CSUs in the United States is ASTM F2057, the standard consumer safety specification for clothing storage units. The current version of the standards was published in 2019. ASTM 2057-19 has two stability requirements. The first, called stability of unloaded unit, requires that the unit not tip over when all extension elements are open and no additional force is applied. The second, called stability with load, requires that the unit not tip over when a 50 pound test weight is applied to a single open extension element. Both of the tests are conducted on a flat surface with empty drawers. Next slide, please. For the draft NPR, staff tested 188 CSUs and found that 91% met the stability requirements in F2057-17, which are the same stability requirements as in the current version of the standard. Staff determined that the maximum weight that CSU could hold on a single open drawer before tipping over ranged from as low as 12.5 pounds to over 134 pounds, with an average of 62 pounds. Staff also looked at whether the units that could meet stability requirements in ASTM F2057-19 were involved in tip over incidents. Staff focused on incidents involving children without television. For the majority of incidents, 
staff did not have identifying information on the unit or a sample and thus could not make a determination. However, staff was able to identify one CSU that clearly met the stability requirements of the ASTM standard and that was involved in a fatal tip over incident, as well as one CSU that met the requirements in some conditions and was involved in a fatal tip over incident. Staff identified 11 CSUs involved in fatal tip over incidents that did not meet the stability requirements. Staff also identified 20 units involved in non fatal tip over incidents that met the stability requirements, as well as 95 CSUs that did not meet the requirements. Next slide, please. Based on technical analysis, staff concludes that ASTM F2057 19 does not address the hazards patterns found in the incident data because it does not adequately account for the forces from child interactions or multiple open drawers, filled drawers, and carpet. I'll get a bit more into that analysis in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Staff also looked at three additional CSU-related voluntary standards. The first is AS NZS 4935, which is the Australian New Zealand standard for domestic furniture that provides stability requirements for freestanding chests of drawers or driven bookshelves slash bookcases. We also looked at ISO 7171, which is the international standard for furniture that provides stability tests for storage units, and EN 147-49, which is the European standard that provides safety requirements and test methods for domestic and kitchen storage units. Staff also reviewed ANSI SOHO S6.5, a small office, home office furniture standard, which is not CSU standard, but has requirements for interlock systems. Staff determined that these standards do not adequately address the tip over hazards because, as with the ASTM standards, they do not adequately account for the forces from children's interactions or multiple open drawers, filled drawers, and carpet. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss some of the technical analysis on the forces children can exert while interacting with CSUs. As part of the CSU tip over effort, CPSC commissioned a study with the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute to collect information on how children interact with CSUs and the associated dynamic forces from these interactions. The in-lab research study involved 40 children aged 20 months to 65 months old interacting with a test fixture with two bars one representing the lower foothold of the CSU, and one representing the upper handhold of the CSU. The test fixture also had a simulated drawer and a simulated tabletop representing the top surface of the CSU. The test fixture instrumentation recorded forces over time in the horizontal and vertical direction. Studied dynamic interactions included ascend, which is a climbing up onto the test fixture and is analogous to a child stepping on CSU to climb, Bounce, lean back, yanking while leaning back, taking one hand or foot off the bars and leaning away from the bar, chopping up using the arms to push up from the upper hand hold, hanging onto the upper bar and lifting the feet by bending the knees, and descending, which is climbing down from the test fixture. The bars were adjusted to various heights to represent different CSU designs and interactions. Next slide, please. This slide shows some example force data from the study collected during the child's dynamic interaction with the test fixture. You can see the downward force on the lower bar in yellow, which is similar to the child's body weight shown by the gray line at the top. Importantly, you can also see an outward and downward force on the upper bar shown in red and green, as well as an inward force on the lower bar shown in blue. On the right, there's a labeled picture of a child interacting with the test fixture. It's important to note that the position of the child's center of mass, which is near the stomach, is located outwards from the test fixture bars. This position can also be seen in the video stills of interactions from the earlier slide. Next slide, please. On the right of the slide is a free body diagram showing the forces on a CSU from a child climbing. The horizontal and vertical forces create rotational force called a moment that acts about a pivot point also called a fulcrum. In the CSU, the fulcrum is generally the front leg of the CSU. The moment is created by forces acting at a distance, also called a moment arm, away from the fulcrum. 
For the horizontal forces, the moment arm is a vertical distance to the fulcrum. For vertical forces, the moment arm is the horizontal distance to the fulcrum. For the child interaction study, researchers calculated the dynamic moment using the forces measured from the instrumented test fixture. Next slide, please. Based on the data from the study, staff concluded that children can exert moments while descending a CSU that are over 1.6 times those from body weight alone for an average drawer extension. This is much more than the assumed climbing force used in the ASTM standard, which is just the child's body weight. The moment is a result of the dynamic interaction with the CSU, including horizontal forces that allow the child to extend their center of gravity away from the CSU. This means that if you want to recreate the forces of a 50-pound child climbing for a given CSU configuration, and 50 pounds is the weight that's used in the ASTM standard, you would need to use an approximately 80-pound weight on an extended drawer. Other interactions in the study, such as lean back, bounce, and yank, created higher moments. Next slide, please. Based on the data and analysis, staff developed equations for two comparison moments related to climbing. One is a moment based on a child climbing a CSU with drawers or pull-out shelves. It uses the horizontal drawer or pull-out shelf extension and the ascend forces from a 95th percentile weight for a three-year-old child, which is 51.2 pounds. The second moment is based on a child climbing on the door of a CSU. It uses the horizontal door extension minus three inches and the hang forces from a 51.2 pound child. Next slide, please. Because opening and pulling on a drawer was a key infraction observed in the incident, staff developed an equation for a child pulling on a handful of a CSU while opening or attempting to open a drawer. For the stability requirement, staff recommends one comparison moment related to pulling, which is based on mean pull strength for two to five-year-old children, which is 17.2 pounds based on the BTI 2000 reference, applied at up to a 95th percentile overhead reach height for three-year-old children, which is 4.12 feet from the Pheasant 1996 reference. Next slide, please. Staff conducted testing on the weight of clothing and drawers using both unfolded clothing, shown in the top row of this picture, and folded clothing, shown in the bottom row. This testing looked at 8.5 pounds cubic feet of clothing fill, which is a value that's been discussed within the ASTM CSU task group. Staff also measured the weight of clothing in maximally filled drawers. Staff concluded that 8.5 pounds per cubic foot of functional drawer volume, which is what's shown in these pictures, is a reasonable approximation of the weight of clothing in a fully filled drawer. Next slide, please. Staff conducted in-lab testing and instant recreation modeling determine the effect of multiple open and filled drawers on CSU stability. Staff found that CSUs are less stable as more drawers are open, and that filled drawers have a variable effect on stability, with a filled closed drawer contributing to stability and a filled open drawer decreasing stability. The drawing at the bottom of the slide illustrates how the center of gravity of a CSU will move forward with multiple open drawers. Next slide, please. Staff also conducted in-lab testing to determine the effect of a carpet surface on CSU stability. Staff found that CSUs are less stable on carpet, with carpet reducing the tip weight of the test units by a mean of 7.6 pounds and a median of 7 pounds. Staff modeling showed that a 1.5 degree forward tilt angle approximated the effects of carpet on CSU stability. Next slide, please. Staff assesses that tip restraint should not be relied upon as the primary method of preventing CSU tip over. This is because there are several research studies that show a large number of consumers do not anchor furniture, including CSUs. The studies we cite in the package show rates of anchoring as low as about 10% and as high as about 55%. The rates continue to be low despite CPSC's active education campaign, Anchor It, which has been active for over five years and other pushes to raise awareness of tip restraints from consumer advocates and manufacturers. Staff also noted concerns about the effectiveness of tip restraints, including those that comply with the tip restraint standard, ASTM F3096-14, 
in the staff briefing package. Staff is concerned that the standard does not address the interface between the tip restraint and the wall or the tip restraint in the CSU, and that the 50 pound pull force in the standard may not adequately account for the forces from children's interactions. However, staff still supports the use of effective tip restraints as a secondary safety system to enhance stability. Next slide, please. Based on their analysis, staff recommends that CSUs be tested in a configuration that takes carpet and multiple open extension elements, meaning drawers, doors, and pull-out shelves, into account. During testing, staff recommends that CSU be tipped forward 1.5 degrees to stimulate the effects of carpeting. Staff also recommends testing with all doors open to the least stable configuration and all drawers and pull-out shelves fully extended. Staff recommends accounting for interlocks, which are systems that prevent multiple drawers from opening simultaneously by having an interlock test and allowing a different test configuration for units that pass. For CSUs with interlocks that pass interlock testing, the proposed test configuration, if all drawers are not locked by the interlock system, open to the least stable configuration. To account for the decrease in stability related to clothing fill, staff recommend filling all drawers and pull-out shelves with 8.5 pounds per cubic foot of functional volume if half or more of the drawers and pull-out shelves by volume are open. If less than half of the drawers and pull-out shelves by volume are open, staff recommend not placing a fill weight in any drawers or pull-out shelves. This represents a worst-case fill depending on drawer configuration. Next slide, please. For the stability test, staff propose using one of two methods to apply force to the CSU to determine the force required to cause the CSU to tip over. For the first method, which can be used for CSUs with drawers or pull-out shelves, apply a vertical load to the uppermost extended drawer or pull-out shelf. For the second method, which can be used for all CSUs, apply a horizontal load to the back of the CSU. The tester should select the method that's most appropriate for the CSU. The specific method of force application is left up to the tester. After measuring the force, testers calculate the tip over moment by multiplying the force by the horizontal distance to the fulcrum for method one and by the vertical distance to the fulcrum for method two. Next slide, please. The tip over moment is compared to the threshold moment, which is the greatest of three applicable moments. These are the moments that I discussed earlier. The first is a moment based on a child climbing a CSU with drawers or pull-out shelves. It uses the horizontal drawer pull-out shelf extension and the extend forces from a 51.2 pound child. The second is based on a child climbing on the door of a CSU. It uses the horizontal door extension minus three inches and the hang forces from a 51.2 pound child. The third is based on a child pulling on a handful of a CSU while opening or attempting to open an extension element. It uses the handful height, which is a maximum of 4.12 inches, multiplied by the mean pull strength for two five-year-old children, which is 17.2 pounds. Next slide, please. Staff proposed that units contain a warning label. Staff provide additional guidance on conspicuous placement of the label over what is in ASTM F2057-19. The content is similar with some modifications to the test and possible new symbols. The proposed format and permanency requirements are the same as those in the ASTM F2057-19. On the right of this slide, you will see two variations of the proposed label. The, the top one is for units that are not designed to be used with the television, and the bottom one is for units that are designed to be used with the television. Staff also proposed a new identification list label that provides the model, manufacturer information, date of manufacture, and a statement of compliance with the proposed rule. This label will allow for easier identification of units. Next slide, please. Staff also recommends requirements to provide technical information for consumers on a hang tag attached to the CSU at the point of purchase. This hang tag will offer consumers comparative information about the stability of products and help them make informed buying decisions. This information may also improve computer consumer safety by incentivizing manufacturers to produce CSUs with higher levels of stability, thereby increasing the overall stability of the CSU market. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the front and reverse side of an example hand tag. 
The recommended hang tag includes a linear graphical scale representation of tip over resistance, a tilted CSU icon, and further explanation of the rating on the reverse side of the hang tag. Next slide, please. In the preliminary regulatory analysis, staff analyzed the potential benefits of the rule. Staff determined that the total annual benefit of the draft proposed rule in terms of the reduced societal costs of injuries and deaths to children and adults could be about $305.5 million. Given that there are about 463.5 million CSUs in use in 2017, the benefit per unit would be about 66 cents per unit annually. Over the estimated 15-year useful life of a CSU, the benefit would be between $6.01 and $9.90, depending on the discount rate chosen. Chart at the bottom of the slide shows the calculated benefit based on the 3% and 7% discount rates recommended by OMB and an undiscounted value. Next slide, please. Staff also analyzed the potential costs of the rule. Cost estimates to modify existing CSUs to meet proposed requirements were as low as $5.80 to over $25 per unit. Using the lower end of that cost and annual sales of 43 million units, the annual cost of the draft proposed rule would be around $250 million. The cost means the draft proposed rule would be considered a major rule under the Congressional Review Act. Staff also considered unquantified costs which includes added weight that may make CSUs more difficult to move or assemble. In addition, modifications that require feet extending several inches in front of the CSU could create tripping hazards. Staff also acknowledged that some CSUs may be difficult to modify to comply with draft proposed rule requirements and may be withdrawn from the market. Next slide, please. Staff examined regulatory alternatives to the draft proposed rule. First was no regulatory action. The second was develop a stability rating standard for CSUs. This could be similar to the proposed hang tag. The third was mandate a more rigorous standard. This is one similar to the draft proposed rule, but addressing a 60 pound child instead of 51.2 pound children. The fourth was mandate ASTM of 2057, but with a 60 pound test weight. And the fifth was a longer effective date because it'd be challenging for many firms to meet a 180-day effective date. Next slide, please. In the initial regulatory flexibility analysis, staff discusses the potential impact of the proposed rule on small businesses. Generally, staff considers impact to exceed 1% of the firm's revenue to be potentially significant. From the analysis in the draft NPR, staff estimated that the average cost per CSU could be between about 5% and 25% of the average revenue per unit per CSU. Therefore, staff believes that the draft proposed rule could have a significant impact on the substantial number of small manufacturers and importers that receive a significant portion of their revenue from the sale of CSUs. Next slide, please. In conclusion, Staff identified the hazard patterns leading to CSU tip over, which are child climbing, a child opening multiple drawers, filled drawers, and carpet. Data suggests that children ages one, two, and three years old are at most at risk for death and severe injury. Staff concludes that the current voluntary standards for CSU stability are not likely to eliminate or adequately reduce the risk of injury associated with tip overs. Staff recommend requirements that will reduce CSU deaths and injuries by reducing the occurrence of CSU tip overs. Staff also recommend including an anti stockpiling provision and an effective date of 180 days after the final rule is published in the Federal Register, which is the longest effective date permitted under the CPSA unless the Commission for Good Cause determines that a longer date is necessary. Now we'll show a video. The video starts with an example of testing the proposed methods for the draft NPR using a CSU without interlocks and one with interlocks. Then it shows an example of the testing the CSU standard. This is an example of how to conduct stability testing on a CSU using the method proposed in the draft NPR. Please note that the unit in this example has drawers only and does not have foot levelers. 
Additional or different steps are necessary for units with doors or pull-out shelves and those with levelers. The detailed test method is provided in tab G of the staff briefing package. To conduct stability testing, first place the unit on a hard, level, and flat test surface. Then tilt the unit forward 1.5 degrees. Raising the rear of the unit is one option for doing that. Open all drawers to the maximum extension and place a fill weight in the center of each drawer. Testers can use one of two methods to apply a tip over force to the CSU, whichever is more appropriate for the unit. For test method one, gradually apply over a period of at least five seconds a vertical force to the face of the uppermost extended drawer to cause the unit to tip over. Record the tip over force and horizontal distance from the force application point to the fulcrum. Calculate the tip over moment of the unit by multiplying the tip over force by the horizontal distance. For test method two, gradually apply over a period of at least five seconds a horizontal force to the back of the unit orthogonal to the fulcrum to cause the unit to tip over. Record the force and the vertical distance from the force application point to the fulcrum. Calculate the tip over moment of the unit by multiplying the tip over force by the vertical distance. If the unit has an interlock, conduct an interlock pull test before stability testing. In this example, we show testing with an interlock unit with drawers only and no foot levelers. Additional or different steps are necessary for units with doors or pull-out shelves and those with levelers. To conduct the interlock pull test, place the unit on the test surface and secure the unit to prevent sliding or tip over. Engage the interlock by opening a drawer or the number of drawers necessary to the maximum extension. Then, gradually apply over a period of at least five seconds a 30-pound horizontal pull force on each locked drawer. Test one drawer at a time and hold the force for at least 10 seconds. Repeat this test until all possible combinations of drawers have been tested. If any locked drawer opens during testing or the interlock is damaged, then disable or bypass the interlock for the stability testing. For the stability test, tilt the unit forward to 1.5 degrees. Then open all drawers that are not locked by the interlock system to the maximum extension in the configuration most likely to cause tip over. If 50% or more of the drawers by functional volume are open, place a fill weight in the center of each drawer. If less than 50% are open, do not place a fill weight in any drawer. Use either method one or method two to apply force to the CSU and calculate the tip over moment. The tip over moment of the clothing storage unit must be greater than three moments as applicable. These moments are based on child interactions that can lead to tip over incidents. The first moment applies to units with drawers or pull out shelves. It is based on a child climbing or ascending a unit. The second moment applies to units with doors and is based on a child climbing or hanging on the door. The third moment applies to all units and is based on a child pulling on a handhold of a unit. This is an example on how to conduct stability testing on a CSU using the method in ASTM F2057-19. ASTM F2057-19 has two stability tests. The first is stability of an unloaded unit in section 7.1. The detailed test method is provided in ASTM F2057-19. Please note that the unit in this example has drawers only. Additional or different steps are necessary for units with doors or pull-out shelves and for units with drawers without outstops. Position the empty unit on a hard, level, flat surface. Extend all drawers to the outstop. During the test, the unit shall not tip over. The second stability test is stability with load in section 7.2. Position the empty unit on a hard, level, flat surface. Open one drawer to the outstop. All of the drawers not undergoing testing are closed. Gradually apply the 50 pound test weight over the front of the drawer. Close drawer or door and repeat until all drawers and doors have been tested. During the test, the unit shall not tip over or be supported by any component unless that component was specifically designed for that purpose. Thank you. That concludes our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions from the commissioners.
Thank you very much for, for a very comprehensive briefing. Um, at this point in time, we'll, we'll turn to questions from the commissioners in order of seniority, starting with myself. Um, Dr. Alcott, I'd like to, uh, Alcott, sorry. Uh, I'd like to take us back to where we began. Uh, staff had identified 226 deaths and many more injuries between, between 2000 and 2020. The bottom line, given the high number of deaths in industries associated with clothing storage unit tip overs, will this proposed rule prevent um, deaths and injuries uh, from future furniture tip overs? Thank you. Yes, uh, we determined from the incident data that children three years of age and younger are the age group most affected in the fatal tip over incidents. 94% of the fatal incidents involving children and CSUs without televisions involve children three years of age and younger. The same age range is also the most impacted group in non-fatal night tip over incidents involving children and CSUs without televisions and non-fatal CPS RMS incidents involving children and CSUs without televisions. There's also considerable overlap in child weight by age. For example, the 95th percentile three-year-old weight, which is 51.2 pounds for males that we used in the draft NPR, is similar to the 50th percentile six-year-old weight, 49.6 pounds for males. This means that a number of older children will also be protected from the tested interaction and CSU configuration. For fatal incidents where the child's weight was reported, the child's weight ranged from 18 pounds to 45 pounds. Therefore, staff believes that all of these fatalities could have been prevented if the CSUs involved can comply with staff's recommended performance requirements and test methods. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me in your presentation is you do have children who you know, often climb on open drawers full of clothes or swing or jump. Do you, do you staff believe that the, the clothing storage unit proposed test actually reflects that? real-world use? So the test and comparison moments the staff proposed in the draft NPR were based on child climbing experiments performed by the University of Michigan, incident data, test and evaluation of CSU models involved in fatal and non-fatal tip-over incidents, and naturalistic observations from online videos showing child interactions, including opening all of the drawers and climbing. Staff proposes combining multiple open drawers, filled drawers, and carpet as a CSU configuration and stability requirement because incident data demonstrates that children are opening multiple drawers, drawers are usually filled, and the CSU is likely to be placed on carpet. These conditions combined with child climbing on CSU are reasonably worst case scenarios that we would like to protect against. Um, does the the ASTM voluntary uh, standards sort of reflect the, the climbing that we see with children, climbing and, and jumping that we see with children going up a clothing storage unit? No. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so as outlined in the staff briefing package, the current ASTM standards misses multiple key factors in real world use, including loaded multiple drawers being opened, the effect of the sloping surface, for example, carpet, uh, on which the CSU is placed, and the impact of climbing and other behaviors, which are all seen in the incident data. Um, so reading in the packet on page 144, um, it's based on staff testing a drawer interlock system is one of the most effective options to improving stability, raising the tip over moment of the clothing storage units. Uh, more than a modification, other modification staff evaluated. Um, why do you believe that interlocks are so effective? Thank you for the question. Um, interlocks prevent multiple drawers and doors from being opened simultaneously, which has been identified in the incident data and which was shown in CPSC testing caused many CSUs to tip. And can you expand a bit on the, the performance requirements and then why they're important to ensure that the interlocks uh, are working? Certainly. Um, as described in the staff briefing package, the key requirement for interlocks is that they only allow one drawer to open at a time, or they may allow one more than one drawer to open at the, at the time, but fewer than all the drawers in the unit. Specific requirements to build on 
to build on this, ensure that interlocks are effective, such as subjecting the interlocks to a 30 pound pull test to ensure it will not fail in use, as we recommend in our performance requirements. Um, do you believe that a, a unit can meet the, the draft proposed standard using just the interlock system? So it should be noted that staff's aware of one uh, CSU that can meet the requirements in the draft proposed uh, rule and doesn't use interlocks, uh, although it uses a similar concept in that sliding door uh, blocks the, door, the drawers from being opened simultaneously. There is also one CSU included in economic analysis which would be able to meet the proposed requirements with just an interlock limiting it to three drawers opening at one time. Uh, well, thanks again to, to both of you. Um, those are my questions for the moment. I'm going to turn to Commissioner Biacco. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, Commissioner Trumka, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Um, secondly, to the staff and your presentation, Dr. Talcott was, was excellent. Uh, this is the most comprehensive um, presentation and package I've seen since I've been here, particularly on this issue, because I think it is a very difficult issue. So I appreciate you going all the extra steps because I think when I first arrived a few years ago, many of them were missing. So I was happy to see all the different testings and calculations and so forth. I do think that this, this new uh, presentation and the additions of the testing that we've done address a lot of things, which brings me really to my first question. And it was a question that the chair asked, and I just want to put a finer point on it. I think uh, the, the chair asked whether this would prevent um, the, the incidents, and I, I don't. I, I, I think that as much as we want them, want this um, new uh, standard to prevent all incidents, we can't ever guarantee that. Correct. I mean, there's so many, just based on your presentation, there's so many different variables and factors that could go into a situation. Uh, would you agree with that? So what we looked at in, um, in establishing our stability requirements is we looked at combining these factors that we've seen in the incident data that we've seen in our analysis that contributed to instability. So the reason why we require all the drawers open, um, the fill in the drawers, and the angling to simulate carpet is because those are all factors that contribute to instability that we've seen in the incidents um, and in our analysis. So with using that as kind of a worst case configuration, I think we can protect from a lot of the potential configuration that a child may put a CSU into. Um, in addition, we, uh, we compensate for children's interactions by using this time interaction. And we use the weight for a three-year-old child, a 51.2 pound child. Um, and the reason behind that is not because it's the most extreme interaction. As you said, there are some things that we found in the University of Michigan data can produce uh, larger forces on the CSU. But we see the climbing supported in the data. We feel that our analysis um, of how to address that uh, is actually in terms of the forces that a child can exert while climbing. And then combined with that configuration that we use, we feel that we can prevent a majority of the incidents, especially for three-year-olds and for some of those older children as well. And that's including some interactions that are more extreme than, um, than the climbing uh, for lower weight children um, or for that same interaction for older children who are similar weight to the children that we've used um, for our uh, calculation. And I follow all of that. Um, and I think that you actually um, hit on the point I, I think I was trying to make. I, I just want to make sure that um, we're not representing that um, this new standard, as good as it may be, and as many things as it'll uh, account for, which is all, they're all good, um, that they won't account for everyone. And, and I, I just, what I don't want to see is um, you know, the, the CPSC come out and say, oh, yeah, we fixed the problem of 100 percent, because I don't think anybody can ever represent that. Um, it's, it's not a criticism. It's just I want to make sure that we're being um, fair in our representation. That, that's all. It's not, you know, it's not meant to suggest that it's not good enough. I think this is a very comprehensive um, uh testing and I think that you're right you know all the different dynamic testing that we did and all the calculations and all the variables that were taken into consideration 
were all very important and I'm glad that we did that. Um, the one question that I do have is we never really accounted for actual carpet. We simulated it, right? We did it at an angle, but it, we never actually did our testing on different types of carpeting, correct? So we did do, in, in top P of the staff briefing package, we did do testing on literal carpet. And we okay. um, we put the CSUs in different configurations with filled drawers, multiple open drawers. Um, and we determined the effect on stability from real carpet. The reason why we aren't using literal carpet in the performance requirements is uh, it's been discussed within ASTM quite a bit too. It's very difficult to standardize a test that involves real carpet because you have to have a carpet that everyone can have access to, right, right. You have to make sure you it properly. So using, in that case, using an angle, which we found in testing, simulates those effects that we saw from the testing on the real carpet uh, is a much more repeatable test. Okay, and, and, I, and, I, and I get that too. I, I, I'm just going back to my point about, you know, there's always going to be one variable that perhaps this test doesn't catch or this standard doesn't catch. Um, that happens in anything, in, in any type of performance standard or, um, uh, you know, uh, stability testing and so forth. And, and I, I get that. It's, again, it's uh, maybe not articulating it well, um, but um, it, it's not meant to be pointing out the negative. I just want to make sure that uh, everyone understands this is a really strong um, presentation. It's a strong um, performance standard. It's a strong recommendation. Um, but in any product, you're never going to fix every possible problem. And you know, I'm, I'm the, my lawyer in me is coming out ringing the alarm bells. I don't want to represent that every problem is fixed. But this sure fixes, I think, a lot more things than the current standard does. I, I, I see that. And I think that's what your presentation was meant to convey, correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, and one last question, and maybe this is a, a legal question, and if it is, uh, I apologize and we can answer it later, but how does your recommendation here today, <coughs> excuse me, differ from the proposed Sturdy Act? It seems like this is stronger and more, um, more comprehensive than the Sturdy Act, and, and will there be conflicts between the two? Or will one uh, uh, over replace the other? Not well articulated. So, uh, so the Sturdy Act was introduced in Congress in February 2021 and re requires CPSC to create a mandatory standard for CSUs. I think it passed in the House in June and it's still under consideration in the Senate. Um, it appears that there are similarities to the draft NPR. Specifically, the Sturdy Act would require CPSC to consider the effect of multiple open and filled drawers and carpet, as well as the dynamic forces from interactions, which is what we looked at in the NPR. Um, it also directs CPSC to stimulate the weight of children up to 60 pounds, which is based on a different uh, source for child weight data than what we use in the draft NPR. Uh, but it doesn't specify any specific test methods or pass-fail requirements. Okay. Um, in terms of stability requirements, it appears to be similar to the third option in the regulatory analysis, which is requirements similar to those in the draft NPR, but using a 60-pound weight instead of a 51.2-pound weight. Um, there are also some other differences, such as a different definition of CSU and scope of products covered, uh, including that it uh, includes all uh, CSUs regardless of height, where we have a height requirement. Uh, but yeah, in general, I, I feel that at least in terms of the factors we're considering, it's fairly well aligned with what we've done in the NPR. Okay. Okay, good. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, turning to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I apologize. I'm still having trouble with, uh, with my video, so I'm just on audio today. Um, I see people nodding. Uh, first off, uh, I, I, I do want to uh, put in a, a special note of, of welcome to our, our new colleague, Commissioner Trumka. Rich, we are all uh, very excited to have you join us, and I'm, I'm glad you're ready to jump right into the work on, on day one. Your arrival comes at a time when the commission schedule is active, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to accomplish great things together. Uh, this is the final of the four public briefings that the commission's held over the last three weeks. I, I think that uh, we, we've done a great job of scheduling this. It, it looked forward to scheduling some decisional meetings in, in the coming months as well. 
it, it seems like we're back to work and, and I, I believe that the American consumers deserve no less. Uh, but listen, regarding the current briefing on, on clothing storage units, I appreciate the, the hard work the staff has put into the briefing materials. These are perhaps the most comprehensive materials that I've seen in my time at the agency. And as anyone who, that has reviewed them can attest, there's just a lot of information regarding uh, the analysis and some very complex technical issues here. And given this complexity, I, I, I do have questions today. Uh, I, I likely expect that I'm going to have some follow-ups. Um, but just as a general matter, I, I want to say this rulemaking, this matter, has been in front of the agency for too long. Uh, it, it's perhaps the longest ongoing unresolved matter at the commission. That's why Commissioner Biacco and I, uh, when I got to the agency, uh, uh, one of the first things that, that we worked on together was sponsoring an amendment to the 2020 operating plan to proceed with a mandatory standard to address CSU tip over hazards. Uh, and that's why I've been pushing to move this process along and share the frustration of, of many stakeholders that this matter to date remains unresolved. Uh, as I said at the time, this rulemaking is a top priority and I, I still believe that uh, to be true. Um, but as was the case in, in the recent prior briefings, that the, the meeting today isn't just for the commissioner's benefit. It's an opportunity for uh, stakeholders and the public to hear from staff. And, and I, because of that, I, I was hoping, you know, could, could you discuss a little bit on why the CPSC's education campaigns and Anchor It in particular haven't achieved the safety outcomes in terms of reducing the, the tip over fatalities and injuries that we had hoped? Uh, sure, I can. Uh, I can certainly uh, speak to tip restraints. Um, so, in the briefing package, we did discuss quite a bit about the uh, the data that uh, that we had reviewed on the rate at which people use tip restraints. Uh, there, as I said, there are several research studies that show a large number of consumers don't advocate, uh, don't anchor furniture, and that's including CSUs. And uh, we, we cite uh, studies that show rates as low as about 10%. Um, the more recent study actually uh, commissioned by the CPSC for Anchor It uh, showed a higher rate of 55%, but there are reasons why we might not think that's really accurate in terms of how many people have their CSU anchors, CSUs anchored in their homes. And we discussed that a bit more in tab C. Um, but in general, there are barriers to anchoring. Um, a lot of these studies that have been done on, uh, on why people don't anchor cite reasons like People uh, don't feel that they have the skills to anchor furniture. It does require some specialized tools. Uh, in addition, they may not be able to uh, anchor a furniture, furniture item in an apartment because they're afraid to put holes in walls. Um, they may not know where to get uh, anchoring kits or exactly how to use them. So I think because of these barriers, um, we do see a fairly low rate of anchoring, which is why we think that we should focus on the inherent stability of CSUs and only use anchoring as a secondary uh, system to enhance stability as opposed to create the stability that we need to address the hazard. I understand. Th thank, thank you for that response. I, I wanted to dive in a, a little bit to, to some of the, the specific proposals that, that, that uh, are in front of the commission right now, um, and, and particularly with respect to the hang tag requirement. Um, is there a reason that staff chose uh, also not to include an enforcement mechanism for this requirement under Section 15J? Is, is that something that, that potentially could be on the table or that the commission might consider in the future? I think that may be a legal question. Meredith, do you have an answer for that? Uh, sure. So uh, as I, I think you're you're alluding to that, provision is proposed under Section 27E of the CPSA, which has a much lower bar for rulemaking than Section 7 and 9. Um, but it is more narrow in scope in that it doesn't allow general labeling. It requires a focus on performance and technical data. As far as the relative benefits of using Section 27E or Section 15, I think we can get into that in the executive session. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to be respectful of of, uh, of everybody's time, uh, so let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, in, in July, I received a letter from a, a number of safety advocates, including uh, Paragon, Parents Against Tip Overs, who have been uh, strong advocates on this issue, Kids in Danger, Consumer Federation, uh, and others. 
outlining their belief that the, the testing requirements in the Sturdy Act would result in a stronger final rule. And um, listen, staff has done a, a good job today talking about uh, uh, about about how the, the testing uh, differs or overlaps between what's being proposed today and Sturdy Act. Uh, my question's a, a little bit more particular. If Congress passed the Sturdy Act uh, during the pendency of the rulemaking, uh, can you talk a little bit about what effect that might have on the on the process and the timings in in, in terms of promulgating a, a final CSU rule? Would we be in a put place in a position where we would have to stop work on a uh, uh, on on a final rule and, and, and start all over again? In terms so I think of sturdy that's implementation? Also I'm sorry. I think that's also something best addressed in the executive session. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. I'll reserve the rest of my questions for executive session. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Tomka. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for the warm welcomes uh, from my fellow commissioners, and thank you for an excellent briefing. I'm I'm really excited that the first meeting that that I'm taking. Uh, is on this really important topic, so happy to get to work on it. <clears throat> I'll just hop into a few questions. Uh, during the period analyzed, staff identified 193 CSU tip over deaths of children. And that's identified incidents, not projections. Um, the briefing package suggested that the actual number could be even higher. Can you explain uh, how and why it, it could be even higher? Thanks. So, um, so the failed incident that we, um, that we analyzed in the staff briefing package are from a data source uh, called CPS RMS, uh, and those are reported incidents. So I believe we get those uh, that incident information from a variety of sources. Uh, it may include news reports. Uh, it may include um, uh, death certificates. But it's not a guarantee that it's a full accounting of every death that has happened um, due to CSUs. And that's why it may be undercounting the actual numbers. Uh, and I'm sorry for that somewhat incomplete answer. Uh, there may be someone who can provide a little bit more full accounting of uh, all the data source that go into that source. Uh, sure, I can add on if, uh, if desired. Uh, so the, uh, uh, so the uh, uh, Dr. Talcott uh, noted, Dr. Talcott noted the, um, uh, unlike NICE, which is intended to provide a, a nationally representative characterization of, of the hazards, uh, the CPS RMS data, which is gathered from death certificates, news clips, uh, medical examiner and coroner's reports, and other sources. Uh, again, it, we consider it anecdotal data. We try to gather as much as we can, but we don't have uh, we don't have the mechanisms to get all those uh, all those reports in. So we do consider these, and and uh, you'll see it uh, represented in the briefing package as a uh, minimum number of fatalities in that particular period. Thank you. Um, so it appears that the vast majority of tip overs involve CSUs set on carpet, and you all talked a little bit about that and how your standard compensates for that. Um, the current voluntary standard tests on hard flat surfaces. Do you have any understanding as to why it fails to account for carpet? So uh, carpet is something that's been discussed within ASTM. Uh, there, there is a task group that's looked into incorporating the uh, something that simulates carpet uh, into the standard, but uh, there haven't been any uh, ballot items accepted yet that uh, that would add requirements related to the effects of carpet on stability. Okay, I, I guess same question with loaded drawers. It seems like the majority of tip over incidents involve loaded drawers as well. Any particular reason that the voluntary standard doesn't account for that? So, um, so as a carpet, there have task groups related to that. Um, I should also mention that ASTM uh, did have a subcommittee meeting uh, earlier in, uh, I guess it was in mid November, where they did propose some changes to the to the standard, which are items that have been pre previously discussed, like carpet, like multiple drawers, um, but that hadn't yet been added to uh, to a version of the standard. Uh, and those those proposed requirements, and if you'd like a bunch more detail on them, uh, would, I think, probably enhance the safety of the ASTM standards, but they fall short of what we're recommending within the ANPR. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I should, I, that, that, that those changes have just been proposed. The, um, the task groups are still working on refining the language, and they haven't gone to ballot yet. 
uh, but there is potential interest in adding some of these elements to the standards. Okay. Um, so including a weight criteria for CSUs was considered but, but not pursued. Uh, and it, it looks like there was a conclusion that even lighter CSUs are, are providing a tip over hazard. Could you just talk a, a little bit about how you came to that conclusion? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. You know, uh, the a weight criteria for CSUs was considered a minimum weight, you know, I should say, uh, but was not pursued. And it seemed to be tied to the idea that even lighter CSUs are posing a tip over hazard. I just want to know how you came to that. Thank you. Um, so we do provide an analysis of lightweight units in tab C of the briefing package. We look at the lightest reported weights involved in incidents, and we are aware of a fatal incident involving a unit that was 34 pounds in the configuration that was in at the time of the incident, which was with multiple drawers removed. Um, we're also aware of a unit in a non-fatal incident that weighed 31 pounds. Uh, staff is aware of some lightweight plastic units and lightweight frame and drawer units marketed as online as CSUs and also have seen many online videos showing that consumers are using these products as CSUs. Um, and staff also notes that with an assumed clothing load of the 8.5 pounds per cubic foot, you could add enough weight in the drawers of CSUs, even if they're lightweight, to exceed some of those weights that we've seen in the incident data. And it was because people use lightweight units as CSUs and the potential to add weight that we, in the staff briefing package, didn't recommend uh, excluding lightweight units from scope. However, we did ask for comments on that decision. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't have any more questions right now. I, I thank you for the briefing and for your time. Uh, I, I yield back. Thank you, Commissioner. My understanding is that Commissioner Feldman has more questions, but to go in order, I wanted to offer to see if Commissioner Bianca wanted to uh, start a second round. Uh, then I'll go to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Has staff looked at the incident data associated with the Australia, uh, New Zealand, or the EU standard to see how the changes that they adopted their affected incident rates once once those new standards were implemented. Thanks. So we did look at the stability requirements and the other requirements in that Australia and New Zealand standard. Um, however, we haven't looked at incident data from those countries. Okay. Is that incident data uh, available? Uh, honestly, I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, because I, I, I just I feel like that would be uh, instructive to to have a sense of sort of the overall efficacy in terms of uh, safety outcomes of of the the various standards that exist. Um, but yeah, if that's something that you could get back, I, uh, that that would be helpful for the record. Um, lastly, I, I'd like to explore a little bit more on, on staff analysis in the packet regarding the potential costs and, and, and benefits of the rulemaking. Um, Again, understanding that there are ranges for both the cost and the benefit, uh, I'm hoping that staff can walk us through a, a, a little bit more on, on their analysis. I, I want to ask about uh, the sensitivity analysis from the briefing materials so that we've got a good understanding uh, uh, of the benefits of the rule, including some of the ones that, that may be immeasurable. Thanks. Um, so the total annual benefits of the draft proposed rule uh, reducing societal costs of injuries and deaths to children and adults would be about 305.5 million. Uh, and given that there were about 463.5 million CSUs in use in 2017, the benefit per unit that we um, that we calculated would be about 66 cents per unit annually. And we presented uh, the discounts and estimated 15-year uh, useful life. Um, and it comes to about six dollars and one. Uh, $7.88 and $9.90. I apologize, I don't have the details on the sensitivity analysis uh, available at this time, but we can get back to you with more detail if you'd like. Okay, uh, I, I appreciate that. And, and my next question did have to do with, with the sensitivity analysis. And it just, it seems to me uh, as a non-economist reviewing this, that, that frankly, that there's a wide range of outcomes that are contemplated in the sensitivity analysis. Um, and you know, when you're looking at the costs too, my question is, you know, has staff identified a median cost here? And is that 
an appropriate method to understand the potential associated costs when we're looking at a uh, you know a, a sensitivity analysis that, that produces a cost cost curve that that is just so so wide and varying. Yeah, and I, I apologize, I don't have that data in front of me right now, um, but I'm happy to provide a more detailed explanation of the economic analysis uh, as a follow-up to this conversation. Okay, I appreciate that. I will reserve my other questions for the executive session, but appreciate everybody's hard work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Trumka, did, did you have a, any more questions for the open session? None for me, thank you. All right, with that, um, once again, I'd like to thank the staff. I think as everybody pointed out, it's been an extremely comprehensive briefing and very helpful to, to us. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to um, close the open session. And as I noted at the start of the briefing, we're going to take a short break and then reconvene uh, in a closed session. Thank you. Thank you.